Hi, my name is Chris Parkhurst. I'm a documentary filmmaker, and I'm also the host of the Documentary Life podcast, a show that spans 140 episodes, has been downloaded in over 135 countries, and uh, I've been producing for about five years. I decided to put each and every episode up here onto YouTube to sort of expand the audience, and as we say in the show, maybe inspire and inform some more doc filmmakers, hopefully like yourself. Um, in the episodes, you may find some older, maybe outdated URLs, in particular, any of the documentary filmmaking courses that we do offer online. If you have any questions about the URLs, simply look in the show notes on this page here on this YouTube page, and that'll be able to take you where you need to go to. Other than that, I hope you enjoy the show, and uh, it's great to have another listener to The Documentary Life. Have a great day. Microphone check, one, two, CC. Hello and welcome, CC. Hello and welcome, one, two, three, four, five, six. She sells seashells by the seashore. She sells seashells by the seashore. <laughs> there we go, rolling. I kind of felt like I could do this. I was even booking our target video shows in Europe way back in 1980 and doing tours with those videos. So I kind of knew I could do it and I could probably do a better job than any of the deals that were being offered. And whatever, frankly, what I didn't know, I would just learn. A lot of it was like knowing, having a sense of who the audience was and being able to convey that I knew who the audience was and how I was gonna get them there. Hello and welcome to The Documentary Life, a show that sets out to inspire and inform you on how to best live and lead your own documentary life. I am your host, Chris G. Parkhurst, and this is episode number 94. And it is brought to you by Barong Films, proud creators of Documentary Film, The Documentary Life Podcast, and The Documentary Academy, our industry-changing A to Z documentary filmmaking program that will transform you into the documentary filmmaker that you've always wanted to be. Find out more at thedocumentarylife.com slash academy. We're going to start off today's episode of TDL by checking in with another doc lifer, Kevin from Canada. After reading an email he sent us a couple of weeks back, I wanted to reach out and talk directly with Kevin, so I'll be sharing that conversation with you. I'll also be sharing with you a very special conversation that I've been wanting to have for quite some time. It is with doc film... It is with documentary film director and producer and independent filmmaking distribution guru, John Reese. John is the owner of Hybrid Cinema, a company that specializes in the marketing and distribution of independent films. And he is also the author of the book on indie film distribution and marketing, Think Outside the Box Office. So as you might imagine, we've got a pretty outstanding episode lined up for you this week. But before we get to all this... Some important news I wanted to share with you. If you've been considering joining the Documentary Academy, we've decided that we will be ending our launch pricing a little earlier than we'd initially planned on. So actually, this Sunday, October 14th at midnight, we'll be ending those promotions. You now have just over 48 hours to get the whole comprehensive filmmaking bundle for just $3.99 instead of the usual price of $549. This bundle consists of four courses that take you from idea to distribution of your documentary film with a comprehensive guide to film funding to boot. If you need help funding your film, then this course is just for you. If you need help developing a distribution strategy, this course is also for you. If you want some guidance with your documentary film proposal, this course is for you. We cover each of these and much more in this four-course bundle. We've also extended our three bonuses to run alongside this promotional price. And those are the Doc Lifer t-shirt, deluxe edition DVD and soundtrack to my first doc film, Journey to Kathmandu, and a 15-minute consultation call with yours truly. I'm really excited to jump on a call with you and help you with whatever challenge you're having moving your film from where you are now to the next stage. I can help you get some perspective and strategy to build momentum and get your film made and out into the world. I look forward to talking with you about your project. This call will be absolutely free alongside the other bonuses and available this weekend only. 
And on top of that, if you would like the option, instead of paying the full amount today, you can pay over three monthly installments. We realize and respect that spending $399 in one go, it may not be easy. So we wanted to allow for this and make it accessible to all. So if you've been considering the Documentary Academy, then there is no better time to enroll than now. Go to thedocumentaryacademy.com, enroll today, and we'll see you inside. So I'm going to start off this segment by reading briefly uh, the beginning, actually, of a Doc Lifer's email by the name of Kevin. And Kevin writes, Hi, Chris. I have a Doc Life story for you. I joined the podcast around episode number eight, How to Finish Your Documentary Film, in August of 2016. I was searching for a voice to tell me to stop the dreaming, make it real. And luckily, I found yours. I've had a yearning to do creative work since I was quite young and invested time in writing short stories, reading voraciously, and of course, watching movies often by myself. But I shared a common hurdle amongst dreamers. I lacked confidence in my ability, and I assumed there was some magical combination of skill, wealth, and elusive insider connections that would prevent me from being able to tell stories that were worth telling. And so I didn't. Now that's the beginning of the email that Kevin has written me. And I'm honored to have Kevin joining me today on the, on the program. Kevin, it's, uh, it's lovely to have you here on the Documentary Life. Thank you for taking some time out of your Canadian Thanksgiving for joining us, first of all. No, no problem at all. Thanks for having me, Chris. I, I sincerely appreciate it. I'd love to hear and I'd love to share this with our with, with our listeners, Kevin. As you know, I just read sort of the beginning of the email. What was it that changed your mind in all of this? Was there a moment that inspired you or an experience that inspired you to, well, start getting creative? Well, I think it, it uh, you know, certainly from a creative point, I think just as you know, a youngster kind of growing up, uh, you know, I always had an interest in reading and stories and uh, um, you know, we didn't have uh, a lot of choices for entertainment growing up. Uh, I grew up in a rural area in uh, northern Saskatchewan, and, and uh, where we had two channels on TV, so we spent <laughs> a, a lot of time outside or, or inside reading. And you know, certainly, my my mom's a, a big reader as well, and you know, certainly picked up from her just a great interest in in reading and listening to stories. And and I think uh, I've kind of carried that that through my life. Um, however, uh, you know, certainly from a, career perspective there isn't there isn't many uh, uh, career opportunities or job opportunities uh, certainly in northern Saskatchewan and writing stories or filming documentaries so I, I went uh, off to university and kind of parked that for a while and uh, got married and had kids young and you know focused primarily on uh, you know providing for family and and uh, on career and 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 that's the case I think for probably a lot of our listeners um, Kevin, I think that you are around 50 years old. We're around similar ages. And and the idea of, you know, having a family and starting a career is one thing, but trying to figure out, well, how do I get, you know, how do I fit creativity in this? Or how do I make a living early on with the family can be a very intimidating thing, especially if you're not in a place maybe where creativity is even is even fostered. So what, how did you end up getting into this documentary thing then, Kevin? It really kind of hit me probably, I think it's around 2003 when the fog of war uh, was out and actually out in a theater. Uh, near <laughs> a great one. In uh, Edmonton, Alberta. And, and uh, when I watched it, I just, I really hadn't grasped the fact that documentaries can be creative or, or have a, you know, a creative uh, nature to them. And I really had, had thought documentary was more simply a, a reporting of facts. Yeah. And when I saw that film, I thought, wow, you know, there, there's so many different things that, uh, you know, certainly Errol Morris had done within the film to hmm. uh, grab your attention and, and your focus and, and really kind of inspire emotion as you're going through, you know, some of the interview steps and, and certainly some of the, the visuals that he provided. And uh, it really kind of grabbed me. And I thought, well, you know what, this 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 might be something I'd, I'd really have an interest in doing. Hmm. And, and uh, so after that point, you know, kind of followed along with, uh, you know, certainly further, further documentaries and, and uh, 
you know, stayed close to it, but still wasn't to the point, you know, certainly still busy with family, uh, yeah. et cetera, and, and professionally. And a very to, successful uh, career. Yeah, and, and I've done, done quite well. And, and uh, I'd have to say that it was, you know, I was, I was searching for, you know, a podcast, something to kind of occupy uh, my mind and my time on, on the way into work. And, and uh, I came across yours and really got, got hooked almost instantly. And, and I think it, it really just started, triggered the thinking of, you know what, if not now, when? It just, it really kind of woke me up. And I think it, it just, you know, come across, you know, certainly through my career and, and uh, you know, in life, uh, you know, several people and events and things that I thought, well, you, you kind of stop and think, well, that'd be a great story. And then you kind of move on and forget about it. And, uh, <laughs> uh, but, you know, I had one that I'd come across and thought, you know, I'm going to go back. I'm going to see if this, uh, this fellow, uh, Dr. Prentice, has an interest in, uh, you know, participating in a film and, and having a story told. And, you uh, we said, you know what? I'm just gonna, I'm gonna do it. You know, this is this is amazing. Well, okay. Let me let me see if I can understand this correctly. What came first for you? Did you have the documentary film idea? Were you already working in the documentary film prior to listening to the podcast, or did the podcast actually inspire some of this? But I had the, you know, certainly had the idea. It was just, it's, it had been percolating. You know, again, it, it just sort of you kind of put that in the back of your mind, and I just had it idling in the you know, the rear of my brain really for a few years. And, and it was just, again, I think the neat thing about the podcast is just, it, it seemed to make it more real and accessible. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, other people are doing this and, you know, I have the luxury at this point, my, my kids are, are, uh, are grown. So they, and uh, I would say at the time underemployed. So <laughs> they, they, they provided some uh, good technical skills and they, they have great, let's say artistic ability themselves yeah. and they help contribute to that. But no, I, you know, I would say it just, it kind of gave me the big push to get over the hump. And boy, once I got over the, uh, the hump and got momentum in terms of, of creating and investing in the film, it, it just, it just took off. Wow. It was just fantastic. <laughs> I, 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 you know, I, I can say to my listeners now, as we're recording this now, Kevin, I didn't realize to the extent of how much the podcast may have inspired you on your journey. So I would say that, um, I am very, I'm flattered and I'm honored and, uh, it, it, it gets me excited to be doing this whole thing. So thank you for sharing that. That's amazing. A lot of work has already been done on airships. There's been a lot of thinking done. My belief is if money were not the barrier, we could probably have an airship in three to four years that would be certified and could be flying and, and make multiple copies and selling them. I believe it's Barry that's responsible for Canada's airship movement and eventually Canada's airship industry. It's not me. It's not somebody else. It's an individual, and his name is Barry Prentice, because he started that spark. When people start to see that in the sky, uh, then all of a sudden we're going to have maybe sort of an airship mania. I've been waiting for it to happen, and and I think at at some point in time, it's just like we had electric car mania and and wind turbine mania. The airship's turn is coming. You know, in that August, when I picked up on the podcast, I, I gave him a call probably uh, about a month later and wow. uh, met him. I was in Winnipeg on business and, and met him um, and had a quick chat about uh, doing a film. And of course, you know, he's he's been desperately trying to get government or industry attention to his plan. And uh, so we uh, decided to make a film and uh, it was a fantastic experience. And I guess to remember with my kids, we were in a helicopter with him. <laughs> flying over James Bay in Northern Ontario and taking pictures. And I just, it was just, uh, it was just an amazing moment. Quite a moment, uh, quite a moment. And something that you mentioned there was being in the helicopter with your kids. And that's a big part of your doc life story here. And share that with us. Your kids are helping you with your film. Well, yeah. And, and uh, my youngest uh, son, Keaton, he's uh, 22 now, but he, uh, he's, he shared uh, Kind of uh, a lot of my interest and in, in passion in, in documentary has, has had the other two kids, uh, Taylor and Alex. And but Keaton and I kind of worked together to figure, okay, how do we put this together, and how do we, uh, uh, you know, what are some ideas around what are some scenes, and you know, we designed all this uh, pre-work, and and at the end of it, when we actually got into the environment, it never really, you know, things always change; it's very fluid. But the kids really embraced it, and they were very eager to participate in it because it, it's um, it's something that I think kind of speaks to them a bit too. And, and they each have a bit of a creative edge and, and uh, they were all more than willing to contribute. And, and uh, like I said, they, they brought things to it. And I think particularly on some of the visuals, just some, 
I would say kind of intense quality to the to the to the visuals and, and scenes that I would not have picked up myself mm. and, and really I'd say made an advantage to the film and and of course my um, uh, my wife Cindy has uh, been you know me enabling a lot of this as well in terms of encouragement and her own creative ideas and suggestions to to make it happen but uh, <laughs> uh, collectively it's uh, you know it's just hard to believe that we now have uh, uh, you know, a complete film. So it's just, it's been a great ride. All in the family with Doc Lifer, Kevin. It's fantastic. <laughs> the film that Kevin has recently completed is Floating Giants, the Barry Prentice story. Kevin, as we finish up here, and, and I'll go ahead and put a link to the trailer up in the show notes for this episode, as well as your website, svenkyfilms.ca. Kevin, what parting words of advice, if you will, might you have for other fellow Doc Lifers who'll be listening to this program? You know, I, I think it's the again kind of my original thought uh, when I first heard the documentary life was, you know what, if not now, when? And mm. uh, it's not it's not nearly as complicated or impossible to do as as you might think. And I think it's the magic is in doing, and you just got to do it. You know what? We have a way as humans making things more complicated for ourselves, don't we? Kevin, thank you so much for agreeing to have this conversation. I love that we're going to be sharing this with other Doc Lifers out there. And I absolutely love that we've inspired you and informed you in any way possible. What an honor. Thank you so much, Kevin. Great. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate it very, very much. Really great stuff there from fellow Doc Lifer Kevin Svenkison. If you'd like to write us here at TDL, maybe you've got a question or two for me or a topic suggestion or a guest who you'd like us to have on the show, you can email me directly at chris at barongfilms.com. And for those Doc Lifers whom a quick phone call might be easier, we now have the TDL hotline, and that number is 1-828-419-4845. Give us a ring. We'd love to perhaps highlight some of you on the show. So feel free to leave us a question, give us some feedback, or you can even share a little bit about your own Doc life. We'd love to be sharing some of these voice messages on the show. All of this, of course, is a way in which we can all stay better connected to one another's doc lives. Another great way is to jump into our free TDL Community Facebook group. If you haven't already done so, I highly recommend this. It's a great way to share ideas, share projects, pick up some hot tips and recommendations for your doc filmmaking and doc living. And like I said, it's totally free. I'll put a link to the TDL Community Facebook group up in the show notes for this episode. Of course, you can easily search for it within Facebook as well. Next up here on The Documentary Life, our conversation with film distribution wizard, John Reese. When I first started making documentary films, I was often making them entirely on my own dime. It wasn't that it was a conscious decision on my part, I just really wanted to get out and start making my film. Does this sound familiar to you? When you have a great idea for a doc and the opportunity to get out there and start shooting, you don't want to let something like money get in the way of that. And for a while, it may not, but unfortunately, unless you have unlimited resources, eventually it will. Not having money for your doc film will slow you down, reduce your crew size, your film production values and aesthetics, even the story you're able to tell. And that's not even accounting for the additional stress, frustration, and your inability to work on the project full time. We don't accept that for ourselves anymore, and we don't want you to accept it either. Money is out there for every documentary film, and that includes yours. Every day, money is donated or awarded to documentary films. Why not yours? The trick is in knowing where to look for it and how to secure it for your film. In the Documentary Academy, we have the most comprehensive funding module that you will find anywhere in any course on fundraising for your documentary film. We cover the A to Z on raising funds for your film so you will never again be left wondering where the money's coming from. Enroll in the Academy today by going to thedocumentarylife.com slash academy and start your journey to raising 10, 25, or even $100,000 for your documentary film. John Reese is a filmmaker, author, and media strategist who wrote the book Think Outside the Box Office. 
through his company, Hybrid Cinema, which is a unique consultancy, social media, marketing, and distribution company. John not only helps filmmakers devise the best distribution and marketing strategy to meet their goals, but he works with them to execute that plan with a specialty in social media and outreach. John has conducted his TOTBO, again, that's the Think Outside the Box Office, master classes over five continents and is the senior lab leader at the IFP Filmmaker Labs. John also teaches at the film directing program at CalArts and is the critically acclaimed filmmaker whose films include Bomb It, Bomb It 2, Better Living Through Circuitry, and Cleopatra's Second Husband. John Reese, welcome to the Documentary Life podcast. I've been waiting to have this conversation for quite some time. I'm very excited, man. Yeah, thank you for having me. Excited to be on. Absolutely, absolutely. You are known by many, many of us in in, in the doc filmmaking and independent filmmaking uh, circles, and certainly uh, a lot of that is attributed to your to your uh, your work and brilliance in the field of of distribution, which we will get to here momentarily. But what I'd like to do, John, just to sort of start out here, can you give us a brief a brief idea of your background in terms of how and when documentary began to take shape for you in your life? Well, documentary began to take shape for me actually while I was a senior as an undergrad and I was a punk rocker at the time and <laughs> I I was actually studying economics and was applying to grad school in economics and kind of like was wondering, hmm, um, I should try out something else that I like and uh, <laughs> before I commit to this and so I interned at a place called Hybrid, not Hybrid, sorry, Target Video, sorry. Yeah. I interned at a place called Target Video um, and started off sweeping the floors. And within six months, I was shooting um, <clears throat> punk rock and wow. bands in like uh, the Cramps, et cetera, Black Flag, et cetera. It's also how I met Survival Research Laboratories. And then after I graduated, we went you know, I went on a trip to Europe. That was my graduation present. And <laughs> nice actually, present. I, I can thank you. And I can thank my parents. And um, yeah. I combined it with um, we did some screenings in Bologna. And then I was, you know, invited to to also screen the target videos that we had done in Rome. And it just kind of blew me away. It was like right in front. It was an outdoor uh, screening in front of the Roman Colosseum. Uh, and there were like 10,000 people there. And it was just like, wow. Um, it's like a rock show. <laughs> exactly. This is a little different from uh, economics. And I kind of that's where I my path diverted into, docu- you know, documentary into filmmaking. Yeah. And how soon how soon after that was it before your first feature length documentary, Better Living Through Circuitry? How soon was it before you began work on that film? God, I think it was like another 15 years because I ended up doing like four documentaries with survival research laboratories Mm. um, and um, all through the 80s. And so it wasn't until the 90s I started I I went to film school, um, did a bunch of music videos Um, and oh, so you went back to film school after having had that experience at target video. Yes, exactly. So, um, and, um, actually one of my documentaries was, um, was a survival research laboratory doctor documentary, which was my thesis. And then, um, I did music videos and then did this whole history of myself, um, with my assistant because we're going to be doing blog posts and I'm also rebranding right now. So we're uh, working on the whole rebranding process or rebranding my company right now. Uh, so fun, fun, fun. Uh, <laughs> that. I, uh, it's like, yes, not, not fun not at all. Fun. <laughs> I actually prefer doing it for other people than doing it for myself. Yeah, uh, yeah. And so I ended up doing a feature film and a documentary, better living through circuitry kind of simultaneously. Yeah. And, um, and that was my first official feature documentary, really good life on the festival circuit. got, um, picked up by a smaller distributor. We actually worked very closely with that distributor in doing, helping them with the distribution. And, uh, they were fortunately, like, I think a lot of filmmakers have their film distributed by smaller distributors Mm. or distributors of any kind. And, are kind of like, at least especially in the old days, are asked not to be involved right. and kind of end up with varying degrees of experience. But because we were welcome into the situation, we actually worked very hard on that release. So Now, it sounds a little bit like that was a little bit um, akin to, 
I guess what we might even classify nowadays as the older sort of distribution model where yeah. you know, the filmmaker gets their film out at a bunch of festivals and then hopefully somebody sees it from there and they pick it up from distribution in that way. Now, mm -hmm. I'm curious what your experience was sort of with the older model of distribution. And then at some point when you started to realize, you know what? There's other avenues here for me as an independent doc maker to get this film out. Yeah. So what it was interesting because my experience with um, Better Living Through Circuitry was actually pretty good because we were super involved in the release. Mm. And I think had we not been super involved in the release, like we brought on sponsorship. We, you know, we were we were involved in the creation of the key art. We were involved in the creation of the trailer. We were like very involved and hats off to Seventh Arts and Udi that he was he welcomed that involvement. Yeah, because that's certainly not always the case. No, no. So we actually had a pretty great experience. I got really burned out by that because we actually worked distribution is extraordinarily hard. Mm. I think that was a better experience because we worked really hard with the distributor yeah. on that campaign. And we, you know, it was a lot of unpaid work, but we wanted to make sure the release was really good. The next and what's ironic is that I also got a distributor for my film Cleopatra's Second Husband mm. and who said that I would be involved but then said at the time look we actually don't want you involved uh. and for me I was so I was actually so burned out that I was like okay great well, you guys go ahead and do it oh okay and and the the you know and they got it you know like they they got it out there they did a small theatrical they you know uh got it on you know, digital and DVD, and they got even a cable sale. And, you know, that's why with small distributors, unless you're going to be involved, it's very, and I don't want to, there's a lot of really great small distributors out there who do great work, yeah. you know, that, you know, film, some that filmmakers can be happy with. But I think you always want to be, and I think these days distributors are a little different. They want you involved in general because they know how much work it is and mm. they're happy to have the, the filmmaker involved. Mm. But at the time, it was kind of like being excluded from the process. It was like, this sucks, you know, <laughs> right. and, you know, how come we're not doing this and this and how come we're not doing this and this? And it just was um, it was a very stark contrast of two different avenues working with a distributor. You know, I got sidetracked into writing feature scripts, et cetera. And then I just said, I'm going to make another film, which was bomb it. Yeah. And, um, and that's the thing, the funny thing about documentaries that I know all you people out there feel my pain <laughs> to me, documentaries are the easiest films to start and the hardest films to finish. <laughs> no, I don't know that anybody's ever said it in quite that succinct fashion, but I might have to quote you on that. That's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. so true. And I think narrative films are almost the opposite. They're kind of hard to get going off the ground. But yeah. then once you have there, you know, you have a script, you follow the script. That's obviously, right. right. You just the editing's much faster. And oftentimes you have the fight. You know, it's not post on the dock is so long and expensive that it just, you know, that's part of what is makes it a much more you're right. Basically writing the film in post, That's you right. know, in most cases. There's a saying in Afrikaans, it goes, net arse en toarse, skryf hulle name op mire en glase, which means only fools and idiots write their names on the wooden glasses. You know, graffiti is energy. This is the, the biggest art movement in the history of humankind. Art is a weapon. When I read that, I was like, oh, wow. We're not asking for the space. We're taking the space. They're waging a war against that part of our society, which, which is civilized. People believe that they live in a kind of neutral public space. What they don't realize is that what's neutral to them may actually be excluding a lot of people. Actually, it's quite beautiful crime. Bomit at the outset very much strikes me as the type of film that is is it makes sense with your punk rock background in many ways for one and your sensibilities there and two it seems like the natural film to be doing what you would then start doing with distribution and so why don't you tell us a little bit about what Bomit was about and then um and then we'll take it from there in terms of getting into yeah. some of the distribution <clears throat> strategies. So Bomb It is basically a film about graffiti and street art and how it developed historically, thematically, and geographically 
spread around the world. And um, we went to five continents and filmed it. And we really wanted to get a sense of how it transformed going into different cultures. But also one of the main themes is of the film is who controls public space. What happened was, is it did like we were at Tribeca and this was a film I was eager to sell. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I had already been through the distribution process and in a sense, and, you know, and I was looking for, and we thought, you know, it was kind of like right at the kind of like when independent film was still doing really well in terms of making sales enough that we would believe that we would sell the film based right. on, you know, we were, we premiered at Tribeca, we sold out every screening, standing room ovation, wow. standing ovations, and that was the year the market collapsed. Yes, and that's right. so we got a bunch of no money deals or very little, de you know, little money offers. Ugh. And, you know, we both myself and my producers were savvy enough to know that this is, you know, forget this. And, um, you know, so that's when, you know, I said, you know, I'm going to do it myself, right. you know, and, and I'm going to run the distribution and marketing campaign myself. And so now, now I have to stop you for a minute, John, I have to ask you at this point, do you feel like you have a sense of, I know how I can do this? Or is it more like, well, I have to do this and I know I can figure it out? No, I think I had because of my previous um, experiences and, you know, I have a degree in economics and, you know, so I kind of felt like I could do this mm -hmm. and I, you know, I was even booking our target video shows in Europe way back in 1980 and doing tours with with those, um, right. with those videos. Right. So I kind of knew I could do it and I could probably do a better job than any of the deals that were being offered. Right. And whatever, frankly, what I didn't know, I would just learn, yes. you know, yes. and cause I hadn't really booked a film theatrically myself. Okay. And so I just, you know, I talked to some people and it's just fucking, I can do this, excuse my <laughs> language, but you know, and it was a matter of, you know, picking up the phone and, this is the film. And, and, and a lot of it was like knowing, having a sense of who the audience was and being able to convey, you know, who the, that I knew who the audience was and how I was going to get them there. John, how did you, how were you so sure of who your audience was? Had you been building an audience at, at this yeah. point or, okay. So talk yeah, to yeah, us about yeah. that. That's important. Yeah. So we had already, like, we were already pretty savvy and kind of aware of this growing kind of like you know, the possibilities of direct to fan distribution, right? Like I had already had some experience with it, but some other people were doing it in various ways at the time. And so we were already, we started writing blogs. Um, we created a website and started writing blogs yeah. way back, you know, in production, early in production. Yeah, right. uh, and so we actually, and this is, you know, still relatively early internet so that our SEO was very strong. Amazing. Uh, so strong so that when we posted about being in the Cork Film Festival, it came up on all the searches so high that Cork contacted us and said, you have to change that to the Corona Cork Film Festival because they've seen your post and noticed that it doesn't say the Corona Cork Film Festival. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, a good problem to have. <laughs> yeah, a good problem to have. And like that was back in the days of MySpace. Yeah, right, and right. <laughs> so we actually had developed, I think, like around five to 10,000 followers on MySpace. So we were, by the time we were in Tribeca, so we had already developed a pretty strong audience for the film. Okay. And so we obviously knew, yes, we had identified our audience. We had even identified kind of like, we had already identified our core audience, mm. kind of like concentral circle. Like I was already kind of like while making the film, I was already kind of developing some of the concepts or developing some of the methodologies. So even before wow. we had that, you know, decision, I guess now in retrospect, before yeah. I even made that decision to do it ourselves, we had already been kind of like developing the Computer. audience, thinking about it. Yeah, yeah. Know. Well, can you share with me some of those strategies and methodologies that you were coming up with while you were in production? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it was, you know, I mean, as I already said, like we were blogging, we were developing, um, we were basically developing an audience 
online with our blog, and we are also developing an audience on social media through MySpace. Mm, okay. um, and I think we are also developing an email list. So mm. it wasn't, you know, it wasn't tons, you know, but at the time it was, you know, very early stages for this, for the, for these things, right, you know, right. and people, not a lot of people were doing this. And at what point, at what point does sort of, a, I mean, maybe that you've described it already, but I'm curious at what point a grassroots strategy starts to take hold in terms of getting the film out to, to, you know, a theatrical distribution? Well, those are, those are like a lot of things you've actually said in one sentence. So <laughs> I, I do that like, a lot, John. <laughs> so I actually pulled that apart and, you know, so the grassroots yeah. started early, like in, and also in our engagement with people within the community. Mm. And then, you know, a theatrical wasn't necessarily certain because, and I was still wanting a theatrical release um, because, you know, I'm a filmmaker and there's still filmmakers. I'm a filmmaker and I want a theatrical release. That's and right. I remember when I was booking Bomb It, like I wanted week long runs. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, that was actually in the, you know, and not everything. And I got week long runs in all the theaters I booked it in, but not all the venues I booked it in were theatrical. Um, one was a space, a museum space in New Orleans, and I'll never forget this, and this is super instructive for me, that I noticed that the theatrical screenings I went to weren't so highly populated. You know, some mm. of them were good, some of them not so good. But then when I went, and then the New Orleans people, I kept on pushing for like, you know, can't you give me a week? Can't you get, you know, like I was obsessed with this one week, you know, with the traditional theatrical right. notion. And they say, no, that we don't do that. I said, what about two days? No, we don't do that. And then when I got there for the one night screening, there were lines around the block. Right. And I was like, oh, what's going on here? That these theatrical events had not been so strong, although we got great reviews. But the this one night screening not only sold out, but they added it, it sold out enough that they added a second screening that also forced another screening that also sold out. Okay. And it was like, and that's what got me thinking about scarcity and the importance uh, of scarcity and um, how, you know, that by creating an event out of it um, and by making it like you have to see it this one night, you actually create a sense of urgency uh, that does not exist in a theatrical screening where it, it basically showing for a week. It, yeah. Yeah, well, for showing for a week could be two weeks, could be three weeks. That's it's right. kind of like feels unlimited. There's nothing special about it. Mm. And, you know, as I say, you know, people have usually better things to do on a Friday and Saturday night than to go see a documentary. No offense to all you documentary filmmakers. Well, I don't but, know what their problem is. <laughs> yeah. Then Sunday, they're recovering from that thing, those things they did Friday and Saturday night. <laughs> Then Monday hits and it's like, oh, I got to get back to work. And it's just I'm too tired to go out and yep. it's still playing through Wednesday. I'll go see it tomorrow. And then and then Wednesday rolls around these days. And OK, I'll I'll watch it on. I'll add it to my Netflix queue or I'll see I'll see it somehow. It'll come out on, I you know, totally, somehow. Totally, totally. But if you create an event out of it where there's something unique to that event, either at least the filmmakers coming or you do, um, you know, you for one of the, what we did was created, you know, we actually had some, spe we would have DJs come and, you know, just create, you an know, event. something special. Yeah. Create an event. And those were always much, you know, and that's when I started realizing that. Um, so from that, so. from New Orleans, then did you, did you immediately sort of put that lesson into place? Did you then start to, did you scrap any of your other, you know, if you had upcoming um, weeks that you were trying to book out, did you then really change your plan pretty quickly after that? No, I was too much of an egotistical filmmaker and still <laughs> just wanted week long runs. And right. I already had them booked and, it also took a little while for that lesson to sink in, I yeah, think, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. And, to, and to think about what that lesson was. So, and then, so we did the theatrical, I cut a deal with, um, new video at the time, um, before they came, became Cynodyme, um, had a great relationship with them for doing the DVD and digital, uh, ended up doing educational on my own, found a, uh, TV sales agent to, to handle the TV sales. And we made a couple of TV sales. Mm. Um, and then actually, uh, there's this company called Babblegum that came along and wanted to cut, uh, webisodes from, uh, my extra content that we had. Oh, wow. And 
Yeah, and also from some of the existing content, but um, create 20 um, unique webisodes. And I think we actually did that with another platform as well. It's a while ago. We actually did it with two platforms, and some of the webisodes were shared, and some of them were exclusive. And and that's where I kind of like got the, that's why, and this was in the early days of content marketing. And that's when I was like, you know, light bulbs were just going off in my head. Right. So I want you to start sharing some of that with us, some of those lessons that we can learn. I mean, all this stuff, to be honest, is in my book. Um, <laughs> of course. And, and, and uh, of course, we'll get to that. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, but, you know, that's where I just started seeing that there was this other, and not just kind of like, take your film on the road, not just kind of like sell DVDs off your website, right. you know, that there was like a whole host of different possibilities out there for people um, in order to release their films outside of the typical distribution path that pretty much didn't exist for most filmmakers anymore. Right. So like what were, what were filmmakers supposed to do when, when that all rights deal that makes their career and gives them their money back, et cetera, doesn't really exist for, <laughs> you know, 95% of films out there, or even maybe with some Netflix deals and Amazon deals these days, maybe 90% of films out right. there, if you're lucky uh, to be very conservative. But, um, so that's, and then what happened with the right. So my, um, the executive producer of uh, Bomb It was the head of IFP at the time, head of the board of IFP. Yeah. And he said, you know, that he hadn't seen anyone do what I was doing in the way that I was doing it before. And um, he said, I should write some articles about it. And so I started writing. I wrote three articles for Filmmaker Magazine that were really well received. Super no one, well received. <laughs> what I discovered is I had this ability to take a very complex system and kind of lay it out for people who who were mystified by the process to understand it in a very, you know, practical kind of way that they could see their own way to doing it. And that I think hadn't existed before. And um, kind of like a step by step guide in a sense. And so some of it was in those articles. I think one was about theatrical distribution. Another one was about uh, DVD distribution. And I forget what the third article was about. Is this when you knew that you wanted to do the book? Was it based on response from that or was it really more? Well, that's a, when it's like yeah. then people said, oh, you should write a book, yeah. you know, yeah. and um and it would be the first book on the subject yep. and it would be, you know, people really need it. So I didn't want to write just the, the articles were pretty much written from my experience. Um, yes. But I didn't want to just do that from my experience. I wanted to um, uh, I interviewed a lot of people. And so it wouldn't just be, you know, just my experience. It was a more kind of universal experience. Right, right, right. And, it is. It's it, I, I can say and I read this book. I read Think Outside the Box probably four or five years ago. One of the things that immediately struck me, and I devoured the book, and mm -hmm. there's so much that is in this book. Um, I don't want to call it dense because I feel like that that would give the wrong idea. It's just that it's so full of rich content in terms of distribution for the independent filmmaker that I had never come across in one book like that. Certainly not right. for the way distribution is handled now. And what I really appreciated, John, about your book was, as you said, it was not only about your your personal experiences with distribution, and namely bomb it, if I remember correctly. But yes, there is also a thorough amount of research that is obviously evident in the discussions that you have with other filmmakers and other um, distribution uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, platforms of distribution. And um, yeah, I, I, I can actually cannot actually recommend that, that, that book enough. Can you share with us um, another distribution method or two that jumps out um, that you think perhaps uh, my audience might be unaware of or just might not be that adept at yet? Well, I think one of the things I'm talking about now, I just did a, a uh, presentation with Sonia Henrici from the, doc, from the Scottish Documentary Institute at the Getting Real Conference, at the IDA Getting Real Conference, and that was about data, essentially. Yeah. And... Um, and how that, to utilize yeah. data for, you know, your audience development and also for your releases and kind of like drilling down into 
kind of Facebook advertising and like um, what you can do with that, what you, you know, how you can track and program and, you know, reach people through Facebook advertising, which is essentially your best, you know, independent filmmakers best avenue towards um, doing what large corporations do with data and data scraping. Right. And it's more generally, and that's kind of like I'm doing a fair amount of research into that now. Wow. And, Kind of similar to the work, the research that I was doing for Think Outside the Box Office, I'm doing similar research now. You know, I would say that's kind of like one of the brave new worlds for filmmakers at this point in time. I think it's also, I think part of the issue is for filmmakers, it's like a lot of filmmakers don't want to do distribution and marketing, yeah. don't want to do social media and hate social media. And frankly, if they hate social media, they're going to hate Facebook advertising even more. Uh, of course, you know? of course. John, as we sort of wrap up here, wrap up our conversation, one of the things that I did want to get to um, before we did so was this idea of self-distribution versus hybrid dis distribution. And hybrid, right. and of course your company is hybrid, hybrid cinema, hybrid distribution is a big thing that you embrace. Can you tell us what the major differences between those two terminologies are? Well, hybrid distribution is basically utilizing the array of techniques that exist for filmmakers to engage audiences and to distribute their work. Some of it might be, and it's it's mostly, or a lot of it is trying to find partners that you can work with who will do a digital release, do, um, you know, do broadcast, do whatever, do SVOD, et cetera. You're, or someone like me, for you is helping you manage that campaign right. um, and manage the whole release of the film. Um, and essentially, whatever pieces aren't picked up by an educational distributor or a broadcaster, et cetera, that you're able to do on your own and you still want to explore, then you do your quote unquote self. But I'm much more of an advocate of, you know, creating a release that uses existing companies and partners instead of doing everything yourself. And most filmmakers don't want to do their everything themselves. And hence, that's part of the reason I do what I do is to help filmmakers do this work. Yeah. And um, everything from, you know, doing consultations and strat strategic consultations, which is what I do for probably most filmmakers to writing full campaigns, which I don't do for that many filmmakers at a time because it's very time consuming and expensive. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, um, and that's pretty much, you know, what I do. And so even if you're going to do it on your own, which a lot of filmmakers do or create a hybrid path for yourselves, I feel like I'm pretty good at helping figure out that process. The book is Think Outside the Box Office. John's company is Hybrid Cinema. This has been an amazing conversation. Now, as we wrap up, I do have to ask you, is there another version of the book that's going to be coming out? Not anytime soon. Yeah. I was thinking about it, but it's it's um, it's still all so incredibly appropriate for where we are at in the landscape of distribution. Yeah, I mean, there are some things like the social media chapter. There's some even there. There's a few principles that are still relevant. You know, the VOD terms have changed, but the basic principles that I talk about in digital, basically in terms of broadcast and digital being competition with each other. I mean, that was probably you know, a little prescient at the time. And now it's exactly what's happening. <laughs> yeah, so, right. You know, I'm going to be writing more blog posts. And so people can check out my site if they want consultation that's on the site. I'm also actually rebranding to a new company name by the time it, I might have a new website by the time this happens where and, and the hybrid cinema will direct to it. But yeah. the new company name is called eight above. So because I think cinema was, you know, feels like it started feeling a little old school for people. And, uh, <laughs> I can see that. So, yeah. And we're going to go ahead and put links to all of those in our show notes for the program. Right. John, this has been a wonderful conversation. As I mentioned at the outset, it's one that I've been wanting to have and a number of our listeners have been requesting for quite some time i and i think that uh, you certainly did not let the side down i'm excited for this episode to come out right. and uh, also excited to see the future of this research that you're doing certainly with facebook advertising and really distribution as a whole so thank you so yeah. much for joining us on the podcast today john great thank you so much
Don't forget, we'd love to have you join us in the Documentary Academy. Come and take a look at how we can help you make your best documentary film at thedocumentarylife.com slash academy. That's thedocumentarylife.com slash academy. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you soon. Thanks again for listening to the show, and remember to like and subscribe to this channel. Also, remember for any of the URLs that may or may not be outdated, and you want to get the most up-to-date information, perhaps for the documentary filmmaking courses, for the blog, for other episodes, just go ahead and check in the show notes below on this YouTube page, and that'll give you the correct URLs to use. Thanks again. Have a great day.